Good morning and welcome to another edition of Food for Thought. My name is Pastor Clint Lang with Hillside Community Church in 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. Glad you could join me again this morning. Beautiful Friday morning and uh, we're continuing on in the book of James. Um, We're starting into James chapter 4. Now, there's different portions of scripture and each portion of scripture has different purposes. Um, The Bible says that the scripture... The Bible is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man of God might be fully equipped for every good work. That's the mandate of Scripture. In this particular chapter, James um, offers the church actually a bit of a rebuke. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to get into some nitty-gritty stuff. So in the portion of Scripture that I'm going to read here, James speaks to the church about uh, the propensity for each person in their sin nature to gravitate towards conflict. Now, he speaks at length about this and how easily such conflicts can make their way into the church and how this should not be. In verse 1, James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So James addresses the fights and the uh, quarrels that sometimes take place amongst believers who have very strong opinions on what is best, or more specifically, have very strong personal preferences on how things ought to be done. Now, these battles can sometimes be bitter and severe. Uh, Unfortunately, over the years, I've seen my share of conflicts in the church settings, and it's not pleasant to witness or be in as a part of it. Um, Possibly you've had the same thing in your walk with Christ. Everything from the preferences of styles of music to the color of the carpets to the length and style of a sermon Um, who gets the credit for the sunday school play and conflicts over minor doctrinal differences that you know somehow end up splitting congregations in two Uh, i've seen minor differences of opinion on how things ought to be done become such dividing points that uh, in one particular case, members of one family would not, they'd refuse to speak with members of another family, and this continued for years. Now, there's some things that need to be stood up for and, and some things that are serious enough to dig in for. They're matters of salvation and essential doctrines. Um and there needs to be division in such cases. But all too often, a lot of the quarreling and fighting that goes on in churches come out of personal opinions and dogma, personal offense over fairly minor minor things. What causes fights and quarrels among people like this? James has an answer. He says that these Fights and quarrels come from the desires within us. In other words, they come from our desire to have our way or the highway. If it all comes from human pride and not from the Holy Spirit, the inevitable outcome will be conflict. Pride is dangerous. It um, permeates our sinful nature, deceiving us to the point of even being proud of how humble we are. Even noble deeds um, end up demolished by our own pride. How much damage has been done over the years in the lives of people in churches because of pride? Proverbs 16.18 makes it clear. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now James, in this book, continues chapter 4 continues saying that we desire but we do not have so we kill 
Well, what is it that we desire in our flesh? We desire to have things our own way. The way that our own personal convictions, based on our viewpoints, say that they must be going. But um, herein lays the problem. Not everybody looks at preferences and agrees that uh, they are right. Particularly our preferences versus another person's preferences. Um, every person has different preferences for different things. Some like red and some like blue. Some like steak and others like stew. You get what I mean. When it comes to our feelings, um, we can let our pride rule us fairly easily. And church life being other-centered as is intended by Scripture, can become all about me. And when it becomes all about me, then I will try to kill the other side that disagrees with me. Now, there's some examples of this sort of behavior within the history of the Christian Church, where proponents of one theological position, um, through a bad interpretation of one or more Scriptures, uh, justifies killing the other side um, because they don't agree and feel justified in doing so and actually believe that in killing the other side they're following the Lord. For example, um, I know that there's some things that John Calvin has written which are which are good, but on this point I... I looked at the history books and, boy, is there some really incredible history about John Calvin. When I look at his life and the legacy that he left, um, it's blood-soaked. Um, a legacy of absolute brutality against anyone who would dare to offer a differing, differing theological perspective or point of reference than himself. Um... He didn't patiently discuss his differences with people who promoted competing ideas to his. Um, he requested beheadings. This is history. Um, made death threats. And praised God for orchestrating the torture, physical torture, of those, or of those of whom he or his supporters thought were heretics. Now, if you put that in modern context, can you imagine armed brigades of differing denominations marching throughout the community, going out of their way to hunt down, physically kill by beheading or burning at the stake all who oppose their views on even minor theological differences? Um, as absurd as that sounds, it, it actually happened in history at points. And not just with Calvin, but with others. Um, this kind of behavior is not Holy Spirit-led, uh, or nor is it endorsed by the Word of God in proper context. It happens when people act in accordance with their own understanding. And if we act with our own understanding, we're taking God's Word out of context at every turn. Um, are we any different today? I say the spirit of human pride is alive and well today as much as it has ever been in history. Um, now, we may not end up killing a person with a different view of things than us, literally, but, um, well, what do we do? When our pride rules us, um, we may be tempted to demonize the other person who has a differing perspective than us, even if it's minor. And we may t be tempted to um, collect and recruit other uh, people onto our side um, to convince them of our way of thinking. Um, and while we can see the pride in others, we must be very careful and make every, every effort to see the pride in our own hearts, lest we become malicious instruments of destruction, killing the reputation of 
another brother or sister in the Lord. Killing unity in the body of Christ. Killing the effectiveness and productiveness of our God-given mandate to spread the gospel message into the community of non-believers that need so desperately to come to their senses and see God for who he really is. Now we may say that God is is going to draw people and they'll come if they come. Well, God has given us a mandate to be examples of faith, love, and purity as well. Love being the very um, center of that. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. No matter what I do, if it's done selfishly, it's nothing but noise, and it isn't pleasing to the Lord. Ah, so, when we fall into the trap of this kind of thinking, and we start gathering people to our side and start assassinating people's character because they view something differently than we do. Um, we end up fighting and quarreling. And um, when two sides do this sort of thing, there's war. And this does not accomplish um, righteousness. It does not bring us closer to God. It does not please the Lord. When we do this, we play into the devil's hand, participating in something that is actually evil. Justifying ourselves and preoccupying ourselves as being more in the right than the other faction that views things differently. It consumes our energy, our resources, and it stresses us out. James continues in this bit of rebuke here, saying, You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you might spend what you get on your pleasures. So there's another wing of this kind of thinking um, that's about it's it's self-focused, right? It's the same spirit. The same spirit that I just described finds itself alive on another plane in uh, in the spirit of pride it's the same plane as the health wealth and prosperity gospel that is being promoted um, so popularly in north america today um, well god owns this it goes something like this god owns the cattle on a thousand hills um, so therefore why wouldn't he want his children to have the best he wants you to be rich he wants you to be happy he wants you to be pain-free. You just have to believe strongly enough and he will just make it all happen. Any kind of difficulty is a result of lack of your faith. Now James speaks against such thinking, saying that um, some in their pursuit of being blessed or having blessings we're not receiving blessings because they didn't even ask God. They're just seeking it on their own. And when they did ask God, they didn't receive because they were asking with the wrong motives. Why? Because they wanted to spend their blessings on their own pleasures. Um, instead of glorifying God, they were looking at the here and now and uh, looking at how they might profit from it and, and live it up here and now. James says that this is a worldly mentality and um, has no place in the church of Christ. He speaks pointedly when he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, and but shows favor to the humble. Friends, what James is saying here is that the same Holy Spirit convicting us of our compromise will also grant us the grace to serve God as we should. So it's not a lost cause. 
He just says that we need to be humble. Grace only comes to the humbled. God resists the proud. So if we find that we're failing on any of these levels, the best thing for us to do is to humble ourselves before God and say, God, forgive me. Change my heart, God, and help me to see everything from your perspective. Help me to see other people and their, and their lives through your heart, through your life, through your eyes, O oh God. Help me to see the blessings of this world as something that enables me to be generous with other people, not selfish and uh, making my own kingdom in this world. As the enduring uh, word Bible commentary says in relation to this verse, pride demands that God bless me in light of my merits, whether real or imagined, but grace will not deal with me on the basis of anything in me, good or bad, but only on the basis of who God is. This is food for thought.